Pablo, 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 Pablo. Good morning, Mr. Paul Reed Smith. How are you doing, Paul? Is this story time? Maybe get dressed up in my own hat. Hey, man. Can you hear me? Hey, you doing, Paul? Hey, what's happening, man? Hey, what's up? How are you, man? Are you okay? And that is a ridiculous piece of wood. Hi, Miles. Paul, how are you? I'm good. Do you mind if we go for it today? Let's go for it. So do you have do you have any questions for me prepared as well? Yes, I do. Why don't you start with one? Why don't we just go for it? But my crew has a question for you first. Okay. What's the favorite thing in the room you're in? Favorite thing in the room I'm in? Um, all right. It's actually, I'm going to pull it down. Excuse All right, me. good. There you go. This was a present from someone, the, one of the nicest presents ever. This is the beard of Johnny Winter. Yes, I'm going to put it up to the screen here. That's the beard. That's him as he's shaving it off. And it was, it's dated like May 1980. <laughs> Where did you get that? <laughs> my, my my agent gave it to me as a present because he knew I, he knew I would just adore this. So is how rad is that? That's unbelievable. I saw him at that time uh, play, and he was literally ten feet, fifteen feet tall. It filled the entire room with his soul. I never seen anything like it. He was extraordinary. He was on fire. He laughed. He, he was doing so well. He was laughing at everybody. He's the man. Yeah. He's the man. You know, yeah. what, a, what, a, what a legacy, right? I hope you hang it back up when the interview is done. Oh, of course I will. Speaking of, you know, legendary guitar players, I know that you had some history uh, with a, a, a local gentleman who is one of my favorite players, um, Mr. Danny Gatton, right? You, you, you've got, you, so please, if you have any Danny stories, I would love that. Going to take the whole half hour. All right, great. <laughs> so Danny, I would call Danny better than an acquaintance, but not a friend. We were sharing a band when he passed away. So my bandmates were his bandmates. And they didn't, when he passed away, they didn't just lose their friend. They lose their band leader. They lose their mentor. They lost their friend. They lost their uh, money maker. They lost their everything. And uh, Tim Beery and Previty and I were in a band together and, and we were sharing a band. Um, the last thing that I talked to him about was that he wanted me to make him a guitar that looked like a Lloyd Lore F5 mandolin. He wanted to have to scroll on the, on the top of it. When Danny got in trouble once for a repair he didn't know how to do, he would call me, Paul, I got a repair, I need your help. He had a repair shop in College Park. Um, we used to go watch him play and wait for the moment. We, he would, you know, we would stand there with our arms crossed and knowing he was going to take us out at some point, take our legs out from underneath us. And it always came and we'd scream. You know, he would play something that was out of bounds. He would play at Charlie's Westerns, West Side with his magic, magic dingus box, which controlled his Leslie and all the other stuff on it. Um, he was a genius. And there's just no question that Danny was a genius. He knew more about triads and how to move them around. And he'd be with his band. He'd scream, Elvin Jones! And they'd go off into Elvin Jones. Hey, no! You know, and he'd literally be screaming at him, telling him to play different genres of jazz fields. And Danny was really, really something. He grew up under um, Roy Buchanan. He was a good human being. I think he was blown away that the music industry didn't treat him the way at the caliber he thought he was at. And uh, I th really liked Danny, and I enjoyed watching him play. I enjoyed him, you know, 
and his, the Charlie Christian pickups he used to make. I remember he said to me once, he's well, if I wind them the same as they're wound, it doesn't sound the same. So I got to do this and I get them to sound the same. Um, he was, you know, one of our people. We had Ch Chuck Brown and we had Danny Gatton and we had, you know, we had our musicians. Um, Emily Lou Harris came from here. Um, you know, we live in the land of the drummers. We've got, you know, Dennis Chambers and Greg Granger and Blues Webb and JJ and Juju House. And, you know, and there was a bunch of guitar players, Stuart Smith and Danny Gatton and, you know, Roy Buchanan. And, phew, God, the guitar players in this town is unbelievable. Well, I'm, I'm just glad to hear. So he was a cool guy. Like that's. Yeah. Yeah. I thought he was a good guy. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. Because because obviously as a player, I mean he was he was ferocious. I mean ferocious. it was just it's kind of mind blowing. You see the control that he had, the way he just manhandled that thing and just make it look so effortless. It but, was him. Yeah. It was. Yeah. He had this you know this complicated picking thing going on and this stuff going on and he he was fluid in almost every style. He could play anything. You're interested in Danny Gatton because you're a guitar player. Really, really good guitar player. And I don't think people understand how much you love guitar. Why don't you talk about when you started playing guitar and how much you love it? So I'll never forget, I was playing football with my little brother in the backyard. I was probably 13. And we had the, my boom box, you know, cranked up. And the radio station uh, played Eruption by by van halen and that was I, that was just a, a pivotal moment for me it was uh, it was just i'd never heard anything like it a couple hours later ba -na, ba -na, na, riff for a whole lot of love comes on and so that was a really important afternoon that afternoon kind of decided where i would want to want to roam or attempt to roam and uh my passion for guitar really started then um so yeah i mean i was obsessed. I was just <laughs> completely, you know, it's funny. I remember I, so I had to, to earn money for my first guitar. My, my stepfather said he would give me a dollar for every stall that we had a few horses. We had some, we had like seven horses. He said, I'll give you a you dollar. Stalls? I'm sorry. You muck stalls. I cleaned horse manure. That's mucking. Yeah. Yes. And uh, to this day, when I smell horse manure, I think of my first guitar. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. It was nine months of, every, you know, going after school every day, you know, shoveling horse manure. So I finally got money for my first guitar. And that was by that point, it was, it was April. Of, in fact, it might, to the day, what is it? It's 2001. And we're talking to the day. It was, it was right around the middle of April when I got this. So, and that was in 1985. And I, once I got that guitar, no one saw me. I lived in my bedroom. My GPA, they kicked me. I was, I worked hard. I wasn't a natural good student, but I worked really hard. And I, you know, I got, I got in the honor society and I was, my grades were good. Within a, within a semester, I'm out. They kicked me out. My grade point dropped a whole point because I just didn't care about anything other than guitar from that point forward. And, and I, I would sit in class and daydream about the guitar and, and what I was going to work on that day. And yeah, I mean, I just, I found, you know, so that's the thing when you're a kid and I was a, I was a small kid. Like my friends were all, I, tr I my, this, my group of friends were a bunch of overachievers, very talented. W one of my buddies was Jason Hansen, who went on to play for the Detroit Lions, one of the greatest kickers of all time. I mean, I just had some really amazing people that I came up the ranks with and I couldn't keep up with them. And I was trying to find my outlet. I was trying, who, who, who am I? I'm this, this kid who can't keep up in sports. I wasn't cool, but the guitar was my, that was my outlet. That was my, uh, that was how I discovered who I was. It gave me purpose and nearly 30 some odd years later, you know, it's still my, my passion. That was a good answer. Everybody, you, you don't know this. I actually got to share the stage with this guy once at Ramshead Live in Baltimore. 
and to a packed house and you went after Immigrant Song, oh my God, with Gary Granger playing bass. It sounded like thunder. I never heard any, the Granger brothers playing Led Zeppelin. That was just stupid. What fun was that? Those guys are great. Well, I'll tell you what, that kind of leads me to my next question. Because I re seem to remember you presented this to me that night. I wonder what happened to that thing. Have you ever worn it? Oh, sure. I wear it around the house. Oh, you know? right. You liar. That, you don't wear it around the house. Do you really? No. <laughs> it's in the closet. But I do, I do really appreciate this because – so you, 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 know, you wrap your, your, your amps in this material, and I just have to know – how, where did you find, how did this come to be? Because <laughs> here, Chris, here, a Paisley case here. Grab the Paisley case. I want to show you something. Let me show you. I walked into a store that for covering couches and found this material and decided I wanted to do this, which was make a guitar case with Paisley. I was told by somebody who I really respect that it reminded them of red shag carpet. Not good. And I liked it. I thought it was cool. So we did black and we did white. We did all kinds of different colors. And then somebody who uh, named Gary got the hot idea to make me a jacket out of the material. Knowing I would never wear it and knowing it was a rock star coat and knowing you were the only person that would it would fit that I knew who was a rock star, I gave it to you, wondering what the hell happened to it. Now, that is what happened. Paisley is part of our heritage. I have Paisley amps all over my studio. Is there another? Is there a box there? Is there a Paisley box there? Yeah. yeah hold on a minute. I'm going to get something for you. Hold on. One of my favorite amps on the planet. So you have the coat made out of the amps. Which which one is that again? Which amp was that? That amp is a 100 watt original Sewell and it sounds like Eric Johnson. It sounds really good. It's a thick, big, nasty, put a mic in front of it and the PA is rocking amp, not a thin sounding amp. Right. I'm that's sorry, right. I like this kind of amp. So that's where the stuff came from. It was made for me as a semi-joke, a semi-real present. I gave it to you because I thought there was a chance that you would walk out on stage with it one day, but I don't think that ever happened. But that's okay, I, it was worth a try. I didn't I, but I wore it. I seem to remember wearing it during that performance year. That's yeah, why well, because I was standing there, but after that it didn't make grade. It didn't it was the last guitar in the boat. It didn't make the front of the boat. I love it though. I do I do I do cherish it because I love the story. Yeah, and, it's a great story. Oh, no, no. You know, it's funny because it was so, so it's really big on me because I, I'm, I'm, I don't have very broad shoulders and you, you know, you've got that, that, that thing that I wish I had. So, yeah. so I put it on it, I'm, it's got kind of swimming in it. Right. So when I wore it and I remember trying to put the guitar on right before we did the performance, well, I don't, I don't know if I ever told you this and I probably have a picture somewhere, somehow the, between the, the bulk of the coat and the strap and the guitar, th the top of the guitar went up and just hit me in the eye. And it was like, oh, that really smarted. But when I got home, I had I had a shiner. It looked like I got in a brawl with Mike Tyson. So mm. I got the coat and a shiner. It was a it was it's a good good job, Paul Smith, for get, giving him a shot in the eye and and doing that. Look, you know something? We all take our shots. But I thought the Paisley was a good shot. I thought the coat was a good idea. I didn't come up with the coat idea. Somebody else did, but. You know, I wonder about the code from time to time, and I'm actually pleased that you pulled it out. Oh, it's safe and sound. So not only do you play guitar really well, you sing really well. And when I once asked Derek St. Holmes, the guy who sang Stranglehold in Ted Nugent's band, I said, at the time, PAs were 30,000 watts, and that was a big deal. I said, what's it like to go up to the mic to 30,000 watts and sing? He goes, Paul, there's no feeling like it in the world. Now there are 300,000 watts. 
What's it like to walk up to the mic for 300,000 watts for a festival and sing? What does that feel like? Well, it's it's probably a different feeling now because of the fact that we use in-ears. And before in-ears, I on a even when I play a club, you could feel that because you would you would sing and you could feel the the, the mains the push. And there was that thing I was like, wow, you know, but now that we're isolated and we have in-ears, you don't get that same feeling unless you're using your wedges. So I could I could imagine with Der- imagine with Derek back in the day when you're singing those songs in an arena, you know, with with all of that, it had to have been quite a feeling. But it's a different. It's now it's like being in the studio. You know, it's you don't you you feel isolated. You can hear every little detail, and so there are positives because it helps you not have to push as hard and it helps you hopefully be on pitch a little better depending on how deep into the tour you are whether you've been you gotten sick uh you do you know then then it's a whole different animal but uh you know technology has made it so that uh it's it has really helped singers out a lot and also for those of us who beat our ears up back in the day you know and have the nice 4k dip and hearing loss and all that it's it helps prolong your 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 hearing uh, so if you keep the volume at a, at a good level, but there is something about singing that is very, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I feel like because of the way you control your breath and because of the, just having melody, just being able to convey a melody and convey an emotion to a number of people, it's a spiritual thing. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, it's when you see people singing things back to you, when you see people crying as they're singing back to you or just elated. I mean, look, it's a magical, it's a, it's a beautiful thing that I don't take for granted. And I'm very, very grateful for it. And, uh, yeah, the power. Do you, of do you remember singing, uh, hallelujah at the Johns Hopkins event where there wasn't a dry eye in the house when you got done? Do you remember that? You remember that? Remember that very well. I re- in fact, I re- what, here's what's interesting about that. I remember s- sitting there playing a few songs beforehand, and people were talking, and you know there were a few people paying attention. But it sh- it highlighted the power of that song. I started playing that song, and suddenly the room changed. That that's a there's a reason why some people consider that one of the greatest songs of all time because it can it literally can just sil- the room will go silent and people will it just touches into it's there's this i don't know what that song taps into it's just it's pure magic i know this answer but i'm going to ask it anyway because i don't think anybody else knows i was around mark when he was looking for a singer and i know that you were in that movie was it called rockstar which was like a deep purple pseudo movie judas it was judas priest it was yeah. like yeah. yeah, and um, so you know, I don't even know how you got picked up for the movie, but ha- I mean, you and Mark have made such a wave in Europe and and now in America with Alter Bridge. I mean, you guys are you know the real deal. So how did that start? How did you and Mark decide to do it? When they were coming up the ranks, uh, Creed back in '98, we I was in a band called Mayfield Four. And we opened for about four weeks in the States, but we weren't really that close. I didn't really know any of the guys that well. Uh, I had a brief interaction with, with the drummer flip and with Mark, I think Mark, the extent of Mark and I's interaction was a fist bump in the, in the, (laughs) at the cafeteria at the hard rock hotel. And that was about it. And then in 2003, he reached out and, asked if I'd be interested in, in possibly doing something. And I was, I was, I was really surprised. I was pretty, pretty shocked. So, um, if you would have told me back in 2004, as the thing started to, uh, to kind of take shape that, you know, nearly 20, what, what are we at now? I'm so 17 years, whatever it is that we would still be doing it. We'd be, you know, looking at our seventh record coming up. Uh, when we when that's when it's written, I should so let's say it's six records completed. I, I I would have been blown away. I mean, I'm I'm really amazed 
that we've had the run that we have. And I think they probably would say the same thing because it's the, as you know, it's the music business. I mean, your chances of, of establishing a new brand and having it, uh, uh, take hold to where you can do it and do it, uh, on, on a number of different levels is your ch chances are pretty slim. So it's, uh, it's been a pretty amazing journey. And I think that a lot of it for us, the reason that we've had this luxury is because we take the songwriting so seriously to me, to us, it's a, it's about the songs. You know, we never really had a gimmick. We didn't, we don't have anything where none of us are really, I, I would say with the exception of our, of our, of our bass player, Brian, he, he, he we're all kind of fashion challenged. <laughs> Nobody's really, really cool in that sense, but we, we focus on the songs. It's about songs and we put we have we love that the art of songwriting so much and i think that that's maybe what helped us find our place and uh we mark and i always agreed early on it was it was about it was about that balance of 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 melody and a certain a certain concept with riffs and uh trying to balance that in conjunction with a with a with a narrative that touches you know touches people and people can relate to so we somehow landed on our feet well i have a lot of reasons why i think you guys are still around too i mean mark just doesn't stop he just don't give up he's never gonna give up it's just uh, not gonna happen no. so you asked me the most prized thing i had in my room that look i'm assuming that's your studio right all right Piece, your piece of gear, your like your favorite, your favorite thing, because I know what I don't know if a lot of people know this about you, but you're really into like studio gear and mics, and we'll run each other. Oh, you've got to try this mic out. This mic's amazing, and it's not just about guitars with you. You have a real appreciation for all things. Well, I'm glad you said piece of gear because if you told me, asked me what the most most prized thing was in the whole room, I would say the four souls sitting in here. Ah. Uh. Um, because I, you can replace gear, you can't replace people, and I learned that the hard way. You know, gear's replaceable. People aren't. Very true. Um, um, I don't know. I had to. I I once had to sell all my stuff, and the great John McLaughlin got in my face, and I was talking about how hard it was, and you know, difficult what I had to do. He goes, "You can shut up." And I said, what are you talking to me? He says, you can shut up. I had to sell my guitars three times. Shut up. And musicians have to go through this. You've been there. You know what that's like. You don't get to have that phone call from Mark Tremonti without paying your dues. And part of the dues is it's tough. So, you know, COVID, we, they, the government shut us down for two and a half months. It was dicey. You know, it happens. Our job, your job, is to put the train back on the tracks, which I'm sure you've had to do with Alter Bridge many times. You know, put your career back on the tracks, put, and we put things back on the tracks here. So what's my favorite thing in this room? The people. But you asked about the gear. That was, that was what I wanted to know. Yeah, all right. So I have, something, I have something I'll show you that you're going to like. I, keep sh I show this to all the interviewers. Hold on a minute. The sound of no quarter. Oh, wow. The keyboard. You know the keyboard at the beginning? Yeah. Uh huh. That's go, awesome. Go get one. It sounds ridiculous. Even if I'm wrong, it's the best pedal we have. Plug it. We use it every single session. Wow. The two knob Mutron phaser. Y'all can shut up now, boy. That thing's saying good. <laughs> I'm going to have to get on reverb after this. And... <laughs> I just drove the price up today. All right, I'll show you one other thing. Hold on a minute. That's the die to make the wire for Fender and Gibson pickups in 1959. I just got it today. What is it? It's a die for making the pickup wire in 1959. That, where did you find that? From the grandson of the guy that made the wire. No kidding. I got it in the mail today. I about lost it. I said, what am I going to do? Put it in a, a box? I said, ah, I'll carry it in my pocket and show it to people like Miles. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. This, you like this stuff. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's a love for these old pickups. 
And the wire was right at the core of it, and that's what made it. So, we're good. Right. Are you good? I'm great, man. I've enjoyed this thoroughly. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Yeah, you're one of my favorite people in this industry because you got your feet on the ground, Miles. I love it. Oh, I Invite me anytime. You can play Camp Town Ladies to me anytime. Last time I played with this band, they he, he made fun of me by playing Camp Town Ladies at me. That, did that, I? That, 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 you did, yes. It was, it, the whole crowd cracked up. It was worth the joke. <laughs> I, don't, I can't believe I did that. What a jerk. Oh, it was awesome. <laughs> I was playing stupid stuff too. I was playing at you. You like you gonna do that? Watch what I can do. I didn't know you knew Camp Town Ladies. <laughs> then again, you do know how to sing and play melodies, so that should not be a long thing for you. Look, I really appreciate you being on Miles, and um, I value our relationship. So here we go. Thanks. I very much appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Love you. Take Bye. care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.